right, what's up, North Coast Young Adults? How are you guys doing out there? For those of you that do not know me, my name is Travis. I'm, I'm now the, I'm called the Family Ministries Pastor. It's a new role here at North Coast, but I was the junior high pastor for like crazy amount of years. So a lot of you have come through it. So there's a good chance a lot of you know me, but if you do no, not know me, that's my role. And I guess you would just say my role as a Family Ministries Pastor is I work with all the student ministries and children's ministries. So it's kind of a cool gig. Um, sometimes I feel like I don't know, I don't have anything to do. I just chill. No, I'm just kidding. No, there's a lot on my plate. But I'm excited to get to hang out with you today. Real quick, you guys saw right there that we are in the middle of life group signups. If you are not in a life group, you should get in one. You really should. The whole point of life groups is, listen, you're going to come here on Thursday nights. You might come on the weekends, but sometimes you might feel like, I don't know anyone. I'm not like, I don't have my posse. I don't have my crew to hang out with, or no one really knows me. No one knows what's going on in my life. If they really knew, they might not want to be my friend or whatever that is. Life groups are designed for you to have that crew that you can now get to know and they can start to get to know you. And we're going to find out today as I, as I preach, it's good that you have crud in your life because that's what God needs to work on in our life, but we need to do it with people in our life. And so if you have not signed up, if you're nervous and you're scared, listen, get in a group. They're all pretty amazing. Me and my wife lead one. I'm sorry it's full right now, okay? Um, it's not that good anyway, so it's, you're not missing anything. But um, you got to get in a life group. You really do. <laughs> So, yes. Hey, so real quick, let me go, let me go ahead. Oh, that's kind of cool. I didn't see that. Sound. Okay, so let's go ahead and open a word of prayer, and then I got some cool things I want to share with you, and let's get started. I guess I only have like 25 minutes, so I have to be really quick, or we'll try. So, all right, let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you so much for who you are. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come and just hang out here um, with our young adults. Lord, the sum of the things that you want to do in their lives, Lord, is, is, gonna t is just going to radically change North County. Lord, these are the people that you want to use. You want to start something awesome, and you want to use these people here, Lord. Would it start here tonight with a challenge, Lord? We love you so much in your name. Amen. Hey, a question for you, and you don't really have to respond, but you're welcome to. I was just wondering, have any of you ever experienced a miracle before? You guys ever experienced a miracle? Like, like I remember, I was up at Whitewater with our junior high, and yes, even though I'm a family pastor, I got to go to junior high this year. I got to drive and not be in charge. It was awesome, okay? So I was at Whitewater, and three days before we were leaving, one of our vans, it's kind of crazy. So here's what we do at Whitewater. When we park on the river, we have to shuttle. I'm going to let you on a secret, okay? Here's a secret. When we park on the beach, like right on the, like we put in, we don't put the keys in our pockets because we don't want to lose them in the river. So we always hide them. Okay, you got this? Here's the secret. We hide them on the driver's side, back tire. Behind the back tire, there's a leaf spring. We put the keys there. Here's what's cool. Anyone from North Coast Church just goes to the van. They're like, I need to drive this van. They just go to that back rear leaf spring, grab it. They got their keys. Awesome, right? So now you know if you're at North Coast, you see a van, you probably could steal it. Please don't steal it, okay? So... We go to pick up the vans to go take it to, our drop, to another place to pick up the kids. And we grab the, this, this van and we get in and we take off down eight miles to, our, to where we're going to pick up the students, okay? And we get there and the drivers are there and they're like, oh, Trav, you got the other keys on the other rear leaf spring. And I'm like, no, why would there be keys on the other rear leaf spring? Oh, well, this guy, he couldn't fit his on his rear leaf spring, so he put it on our other side car, and we're like, no. So we go and look in the, the van. There's no keys there. So me and three, me and two other guys, the three of us, we spend the next two hours driving up and down that eight-mile road looking for keys. We have to call Enterprise. It's going to take them forever to get us keys. And we aren't allowed to leave the car there, so we are now praying for keys. A whole day goes by, no keys. We go into town. Did anybody find keys on the road? Anyone? Does anyone stop and all of a sudden see keys? No. Another day goes by. We are now into the third day. And this day, if we don't have the keys by the morning at 7 a.m., we are jacked because we don't have enough vehicles to get somewhere. And I can't leave the vehicle by the road. We take our 150 junior hires to town to go get ice cream. We do it in shuttles. And our last shuttle, we are leaving, a vehicle rolls up and says to my sister, she was one of the drivers, they're like, hey, did anybody lose keys? 
okay? And we got the keys. I'm like, that's a miracle. Now you guys are like, Trev, that's not a miracle. Okay, okay, okay. To me, it was a miracle. Have you ever experienced a supernatural miracle? Have you guys ever experienced that? I remember it was years and years ago. It was about 10, 12 years ago. Our facility director here, his name was Tracy. And he had been told that he was diagnosed with colon cancer. And he was freaked out. I mean, we were praying. He is going, before he's going to do his chemotherapy, I mean, yes, before he's going to do chemo, he is praying like crazy. They're going to do an operation to remove it, and then he's going to do chemo. And we are praying like crazy for Tracy. And I remember he goes to the surgeon. The surgeon's going to perform on him. And all of a sudden, they can't find the cancer to remove. In fact, the surgeon can't find any evidence there was cancer there. In fact, when they wake him up, they said, are you sure you had cancer? And he's like, I don't know. You guys are the ones that told me I had cancer. You want to know a supernatural miracle? That is a supernatural miracle. And I've seen over the years in ministry, I have seen a lot of supernatural miracles miracles. But you know what's greater than supernatural miracles? There's something that's greater than a supernatural miracle that I've witnessed some incredible ones. What's way greater, way greater is a changed life. Someone's life that is radically changed is way greater. It's like when somebody's going one direction, they're going a direction, they're like, that guy's jacked. And then somehow the Holy Spirit grips them and they move a different direction. When I see that, that's what brings more tears to my eyes. When you see real life change happen. I remember there was, I was doing a wedding, a, a renewal of vows for a couple. They, it was, I think it was going to be like 30-year renewal of vows. Or, you know, it was a lot of years. They've been married a long time. And they are this amazing couple that are the best servants I've ever seen at North Coast Church. If you knew them, you'd be like, oh, I know, they're, they're legit. They do so much for my ministry. I'm like, heck yeah, I'll do renew your vows. Don't pay me. I just want to be a part of it. And I remember I'm sitting down. It's like, well, I got to do your story. People got to know your story. Like, Trav, everyone knows our story. I don't know your story. I've known you a long time. So they sit down and tell me their story. And I'm like, how'd you guys get to North Coast? You guys are all-star volunteers. How'd you get here? And she says, well, let me tell you. My husband, this guy, which this guy was the most incredible servant I've ever seen in my life. This guy right here is the biggest jerk. I'm like, no, not Joe. Oh, no, Trav, you don't understand. He was so bad that I was leaving him. I was going to leave him. I was going to take my kids, and we were taken off. I was like, really? And she's like, for some reason, I decided to come to North Coast Church the week before I was going to leave him. I came to North Coast Church. And she starts telling me this story, how she starts going to church, and the Holy Spirit starts changing her life. Some cool stuff happening. And she, for some reason, is like, well, I guess God's changed my life. I guess I need to stay with my husband. So she starts staying with her husband. And here's the crazy thing. Jerk Joe, okay, starts to notice that his wife is different. He's like, there's something different about you. What is it? And she's like, well, I found Jesus Christ. I'm going to go to North Coast Church. She's like, I got to go. And he goes And God radically changes his life. He's like, from the stories they tell me, that's not even Joe. And I remember when I was doing the renewal of vows, there was over 100 people in there. I said, how many of you here today are at church, have found Jesus Christ just because of Joe's changed lives? And over 30 hands went up. 30 hands. I was like, what? What? And I remember after doing the renewal of vows, I remember them going, no, you don't understand, Trav. You don't understand. See, here's the thing I will tell you. When a life is changed, when you make a decision to follow Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes and radically changes your life, that is the biggest miracle there is. This is the most incredible miracle. And those are the type of miracles that brings tears to my eyes all the time. And here's the thing is we've been doing a series called The Holy Spirit. And we've been talking about this the last, I think almost all summer, about this idea of an ax that the Holy Spirit is to come in and he's supposed to change your life and he's still start working in your life and you are supposed to start to look different. You're supposed to look like a different person. And that's the Holy Spirit does. 
And I want you to know something. If, if, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ in your life, if you're at a place where you're like, Trav, you don't know what's going on in my life. It is crazy right now. I don't think anyone loves me. I want you to know something. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, and he says he loves you, and he wants to come inside your life, and he wants to change your life, and he just wants you to believe in him and say, hey, you can have my life now. Well, that's a radical thing to give him your life. But if you're willing to give your life, the Holy Spirit will actually come, and he starts changing your life. Now, here's the thing. Once he starts changing your life, we've been talking this whole, this whole summer about the Holy Spirit. Now what? What are we supposed to do now? Okay, are we supposed to just be like, Holy Spirit, what are we doing now? Me and you, let's do it. What are we supposed to do? So Nat is like, Trav, we talked about us, then now what? I'm like, now what? Okay, let's, let's figure this out. And I was just reading, I was reminded of 2 Peter. If you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, it is way, 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 way back in the Bible. Okay, if you go all the way to Revelation, you're going to go back a book to Jude. Then you're going to go back a book to 3 John, to 2 John, to 1 John. And then there should be 2 Peter. And 2 Peter is, I think, like in my Bible, I think it's like three pages. Okay, it's not very big. And we are coming to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Five, verse five, okay? I'll give you a few seconds. If you have a, if you have a pen, if you have a, a, something to write with, I like to use my Bible as a notebook. You got an underlined circle. I might have you tell you to write down some things. Get ready. Um, don't have your Bible as long as me where it falls apart like that, but I just love it. Eventually, it's gonna just dissolve. Okay, so here we go. First Peter 2, five, it says, for this very reason... He starts with this very reason. So you're like, wait, for this very reason, that implies something he just said. So you have to go back to actually verse three. It says this, his divine power, he's talking about God, has, been, has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. He's talking about our God has given us everything that we need. He's given us the Holy Spirit. Once you've accepted Jesus Christ, now you're a Christian Follow him. Now what? And he says, for this very reason. I love this. He's actually given us an action step. I love what Peter says. He says this, make every effort to add to your faith. He wants us to add to our faith. The first step as a Christian is you better have faith. Faith is the first step. I accept Jesus Christ. I had to have faith. I had to have faith that I believe in something I can't see, but I believe in this God. God, I believe in you. I have faith because I can't see you, but I've seen you work in other people's lives. I know you are real. You have faith. You start with this idea of faith and you ask Jesus Christ in your life. And he says, add to your faith. The first thing he says, good, goodness, goodness, add to your faith, goodness. If you want, you can circle goodness, maybe write an arrow, goodness. So after you have faith, you're supposed to be good. What's goodness? Goodness is being good. You know, if the Holy Spirit's really work inside of you, the next step should be that you're starting to look different. You actually might not be as bad as you used to be. You know, there's sometimes, there's people where they would cuss all the time, and then Jesus Christ came to life, and it's weird how they didn't cuss as much. It's weird how they stopped flipping people off sometimes. It's weird how there was other thoughts or things they'd say about people. They didn't say those things as much as the Holy Spirit was coming in. We are supposed to work now on being good. And the Holy Spirit's working on that. And then I love it. It says this, add to your goodness, knowledge. Add to your goodness, knowledge. The next step should be adding something, knowledge. What does that mean? If you have the Holy Spirit in your life and you're working and he's working on the next step should be, you should want to know what it means to follow him. Guess where that is? It's right here. And I remember when I was a young Christian, just got into college. I remember our college group, college age group, okay? We would go after like almost, seemed like almost every night we were hanging out. Like we'd be out till like two in the morning or something like that. And I remember we'd go walks on the Carlsbad seawall. We'd go get coffee and just we would walk and talk. And sometimes we'd talk about life. Sometimes we'd talk about girls. And sometimes we'd actually talk about God. And I remember as we start talking to God, we'd get into these brain debates. And I remember 
that I grew so much because some people be talking about what God's teaching them. And I'd, I'd be like, I got to go see what they're talking about. So I'd come home that night and I would spend an extra hour reading the word. Okay, me and God's time was in my bathroom at my, at my parents' house because there was five kids in the family. It was this huge circular bathroom, okay? And there was actually a place that I could sit down and study the word and I would read my Bible in the bathroom. So at two in the morning, I wasn't bothering anyone. I wasn't loud. And I would read for sometimes an hour or two and just digest the word because I wanted to be able to go, what were they talking about? Why are they talking that way? How can I now be a part of that conversation? And there was a two or three years of just this knowledge that God was just pouring into me. Listen, if you're, if you're just starting to become, if you're like a baby Christian learning there, I want to encourage you. We need to add to that goodness now knowledge. The next step it says is add to knowledge. It says add to knowledge self-control. 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 You know what? After, after maybe you're starting to be good, maybe you're, you're starting to gain this knowledge, there's this idea that the Bible's saying that we should start having self-control. You know those times where you wanted to say that in the last minute, the Holy Spirit's saying, what are you saying? And you don't, self-control. There are some certain habits you have that are not healthy habits that you're doing, but you're starting to realize you're working on those habits. Some of you have addictions. That now the next step is after knowledge, there's this idea of these addictions. You're working on these addictions. You're working on self-control. And then it says self-control to perseverance. Is that what your says? Perseverance? You know what perseverance is? Perseverance is this idea of when you're going through hard times, you can persevere. I remember there's a story, there's a, there's a story about the, the, the good soil that's found in Matthew. And there's this story about this farmer goes to sow seed, and he's throwing out seed and he throws it on the, the hard grounds and the birds come and eat it up. And then he throws it on rocky soil and the weeds, the, 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 the seed sprouts up, but then there's no soil. There's not enough soil that when the sun comes, it, it dries it out and it withers. And it talks about these different soils. But what it's trying to say is a lot of these seeds, besides the one that got in good soil, the good soil, the one that got in good soil, it like produced a ton. You know, it just grew like crazy. The point was the ones that didn't make it, they went through hard times. Do you know what I see a lot of young Christians? A lot of young Christians, when they go through a hard time, oh, I used to see it. People are on fire for Christ. They're like, oh my goodness. They're raising their hand at every worship song. I mean, they're like, this is the most incredible thing. They talk Jesus talk. They're on fire. They can't wait to absorb more knowledge, more. They're just absorbing. And then they go through a hard time. They go through a hard time and they're like, Jesus, where are you now? Where are you now, Jesus? And the hard part is he says, Peter says, no, we need to now create perseverance. I love it. In 1 James, it talks about consider it pure joy when you go through hard times. Because the test in your faith develops perseverance. It makes you stronger. We need to go through times where you should almost be going through times because you know they're going to make you stronger. I just went through a hard time. Some of you know we just lost one of our employees, one of the ladies that was pretty much started in CLA, passed away last week. It was a hard battle. We prayed all the time. I've been through a lot of hard seasons in my life. I can give you season after season of hard times. But I think some of those hard times is God's trying to teach us perseverance because he said, guess what? You can't be whole and complete without being experiencing perseverance, getting through this thing. Because most Christians, you go through it and you walk away. You go, peace out, God. You must not be real. You know what I love? Did you know that most atheists that don't believe in God actually believe in God? They're just pissed off at God. They're pissed off because they went through a hard time. And where was God during that time? And so God, if you're not going to help me, then you must not be real. But you must be real because I keep talking to you, but you're not real. And the problem is those hardships, they just, they weren't mature enough. They hadn't gone through that. And then he goes through a next step. He says, add to perseverance. I think it's godliness. Let's see. I'm, I should have it memorized. Now. I've read it so many times. Yes, a perseverance, godliness. What is godliness? Godliness is when you're starting to become more godly. What does that even mean? It means when you start to be set apart, you start to look different. 
If I were you, I'd circle that, put set apart. You know what the next step in your growth is? When you get to the point where when you're living life, you're different. People notice you're different. Like my friend Joe and his wife, they're like, something's different. How come we want to go this way, but you want to go this way? I love if you're watching, if you're watching the Chosen series. The opening script is this fish that's going against the flow. It's set apart. It's different. He's going a different way. When we are becoming more and more godly, we start going a different way. The world's going this way, and we look different. And we should stand out. And you should almost stand out so that people sometimes make fun of you. Guys, I've been made fun of. My story, I don't know why God designed me this way. Maybe he knew that I was going to be on stage, and I'd have to have a crap load of stories. But I've experienced weird stuff. Like, you know when you watch the movies and there's these huge rager parties where there's 200, 300 people, this huge party, and they decide to pick on the nerdy kid? That was me. I would go to these parties thinking, I still want to be a Christian, but I want to experience it. And everyone's drunk except Travi because he only drinks Mountain Dew. (laughs) Everyone's going on the beer runs. Can you get me Mountain Dew? (laughs) And I remember that I was at this party, the music's raging. I mean, it's like 200 people going up and down, just jumping, and the music just cuts off. And the DJ points to me, see that guy, Travis? He's a virgin, and everyone just starts mocking me and laughing at me. And he lets them mock at me for about a minute or two and then turns the music back up. You don't think I've ever been humiliated? You don't think I've ever been like made fun of for going that direction? Yes. But what if God's saying, Trav, what if, first, what if Peter's saying, that's what needs to happen? You're starting to become set apart. Have you gotten that point yet? And then I love it. Then he says, add to your godly, godliness brotherly kindness. It's so weird. It goes this intense. Be set apart. And then it goes brotherly kindness. And you're like, What? Brotherly kindness, that just means that you're actually kind to your brothers. You're kind to your friends. And then it says, add to brotherly kindness, love. And I love that love is at the end because we live in a world that it's all about love. Just love. All we need is love. You know, all we need. Okay, never mind. So, but we're in this world where it's like, that's all we need is love. And I love how it's at the end, because I'll be honest with you, you know what's the hardest to do is really love. Because you know what love really is? It's an action. And you know what it means is God calls us to love our enemies. It calls us to love the people we hate. It calls us to love the people we don't like. But he calls us to love, and that is the hardest thing, to actually be right next to someone that you disagree with everything they do. You disagree with who they are. They annoy the heck out of you, and there's All you are trying to do is trying to. The Holy Spirit's keeping you from not wanting to cuss them out, not wanting to beat them up, not wanting to talk bad at them. And then you decide to choose and still show them love. Where you still, maybe you help them. Maybe you um, encourage them. Maybe you choose not, you have patience with them. So you don't act out the way you want to. But that is the real act. And I love this because I read this. And so it says, add to that love. And this is what it says. It says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will keep you from that. You know what's crazy is as I was reading this, I started to realize that's just not things we should be doing. I think that's how we actually grow. I think Peter was trying to say, you know what? Where are you on this step? Where are you on that spectrum? Because the Holy Spirit should be starting to work in your life. And that's what it starts to look. You should start to look good. And then you should start to work on knowledge. And it should be these things. So what does that mean? I've only got a few minutes. Okay, I went a little longer than I thought. But I want to encourage you on a couple things. One is this. You need to first think, where are you on this journey? 
Listen, if you just accept Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit's just working on you, it might be that you just are the first step of faith, but now you need to add to that faith. You actually have to take a step. Think about that. Where are you on that journey? I wonder how many of you, and I was saying that you're like, I haven't learned that yet. <laughs> Man, I'm not good at that yet. I haven't been through that yet. That's fine. But think about it. Another thing that I want to encourage you to do is first think about the second thing is ask God to work on one of those. You know what you really want to do is instead of worrying about being good, say, God, would you teach me this? Would you help me? Now, I want you to know something that's crazy. That is fighting words with God. Not fighting words, but I'm telling you, it feels that way. Because guess what? One time I asked God, God, I just want to be more patient with people. God, please. And I remember I prayed for a whole week, and I thought stupidly, God, this just goes, Whoop, and then I'm patient. And it's weird. People try to make fun of him. I'm like, no big deal. No, you know what he did? I got stuck in an airport for three days. You want to learn patience, you get stuck in the airport for three days. Is that weird how God works? So that's what I mean by fighting words. But here's the cool part is he might put you in situations that forces you to grow. He actually forces you to do that. I want to encourage you, go ask God. God, I want to work on these things. God, I want to go to the next step. God, will you add that to me? I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you also to understand that when you fail, it's okay. Let's say you're working on self-control. You're like, why do I keep failing? Well, guess what? That's exactly what happened to Paul who wrote almost the whole Bible. It's found in Romans. He says, why do I keep doing what I don't want to do? And what I don't want to do, I keep doing. He's like, I, I can't win. So don't be afraid when you fail. When you're going on this journey and you first think about where you are, then you say, God, help me work on these things. When you fail, it's okay. It's okay. I want to encourage you. Another thing is this. You should never stop growing. You should never stop changing. I'm in my 40s. I want you to know I'm not done. And I've been reading the Bible a lot. I love to read Kings because the Kings are jacked up. People that were in power. Don't you think if you were in power and you loved the Lord, you would have been awesome? No. You have these kings that have all the power. They have the Holy Spirit. I mean, they have the, the, the Lord is their God. They're worshiping them. And they're more jacked up than any of you in here. And it's crazy. Some of that started good. When did they go bad? It was their 40s. And I'm like, oh, crud. I've been a pastor for 20-something years. And you're telling me I can still go bad? I can still walk away, God? You're saying that I could something? God, please grow me. I'm trying to get to perfection, but I know this, I'm never going to get to perfection until I get to heaven. You're never going to get there, but never stop. You should be asking God, what's next? God, what's next? God, what's next? And the last thing I want to encourage you is this. I want to encourage you that when you go through hard times, actually rejoice. Rejoice. When you're going through hard times, when God's teaching you these things, we should actually be happy and it doesn't make sense. But here's the thing, is if God's ultimately changing me, if God is working on me, if God is working on you and he is growing you and he is making you more like him and he's changing your life and the greatest miracle is a changed life, then when you're going through that process, you should celebrate. You should be like, God, thank you. I was driving to the hospital. My son was born early, was gonna be born early. We had no clue why. And I remember we're going to the hospital and I'm like, God, I don't know why you're doing this, but I'm just gonna celebrate because you must think I can take this. You must think that whatever's coming next, we can do it. So I'm gonna celebrate that. And then I secretly go, and God, please help me not to, be, not to fail. And there's been journey after journey my whole entire life where I go through a hard time and I've started to go, you know what? People are like, trap, that sucks. And I go, I know it sucks, but I guess God must be teaching me something. God must think I can handle this. And remember that thing, perseverance? When you persevere and you come out of it, your walk is so strong. You can sometimes get a point and go, God, whatever it takes, and then go, no. God, not true. That's not true. 
but you might feel that way because you've gone through it. And when you do that, you're not going to become an atheist someday because you're going to understand that God is good. It's always when I look in the rearview mirror and I see what God actually was doing and I see the change stuff that's happening in my life, that's when I go, oh my goodness, God, now I get it. But it's always two, three, four, five, six years later. Some of the hardest times of my life, I go, why do I have to go through that? And now I go, I'm so glad I went through that. Listen, the Holy Spirit's gonna come in your life. He's gonna start changing you, but you got to now act. Peter says, keep adding to this, adding to this. We can't sit there. We need to move. Where are you on that? Where are you? And then ask God, God, start working on it. Start working on it. Dear God, I just thank you so much that I get to come and hang out with, with these young adults here, Lord. I don't know what you were trying to teach them, Lord. Maybe they're not going through this stuff. Maybe they're already on the godliness and like, Trav, waste of our time. But Lord, I do know that you're working. And here's the thing, Lord, is here's what I'm excited. Lord, if these young adults just start working on the next step, Lord, you know you will radically change this place. This place will grow so big, nobody will want, we won't be able to fit it. We're gonna have to go to other buildings, Lord. And then slowly and slowly, it will start changing our college campuses. It'll start changing our workplaces. It'll start changing Vista, ocean sites. Lord, the, the ripple effect, because guess what? Who's in this room right now? Lord, they are who you wanna use right now to do something amazing. And it starts with them just adding to their faith. Lord, we add to our faith. Would you work in our lives, Lord? you remind us to celebrate even in the hard times. We love you so much in your name.